Hi guys, how you doing? This is Tracy Daly, and I've just come off a video interview with a lady who's a clinical psychologist, and she's doing a research on the effects of homicide in children and how that changes them throughout their life. She specifically was looking for the positives and people who've been bereaved by somebody who's been killed. And what was supposed to be an hour and to an hour and a half video ended up being two hours. And she was absolutely brilliant. I thoroughly enjoyed it. So good luck to her. She is still probably only temporarily looking for other people who've been through similar. So if you have and you're listening and you're comfortable, it is completely anonymous and it may actually help somebody one day, especially if you have a positive story of how you've overcome trauma in one fashion or another get in touch reach out i'll put you in touch with her no problem i want to shout out to andy's man club which seems to be growing exponentially and taking over the uk they're absolutely brilliant from what i've read and understand and from the hundreds of men specifically that have got involved in it they're having regular meetups all over the place have a look at them online they're on facebook they're on the internet they're on instagram they're absolutely everywhere that's andy's man club and from what i understand they're in the majority of areas and you can just turn up have a chat tell them what's going on with you and that could be nice and easy, relaxed, just a meet up, or that could be the most dramatic things you've been through. These guys are really, really good. If I'm correct, I believe they have pop-up centers as well. So they'll meet up for a coffee or they'll meet up down the local or wherever it needs to be. Um, do correct me if I'm wrong if you're from Andy's Man Club there, but I'm pretty sure I read that. They have some sort of mental health first aid team going on as well, which is absolutely brilliant. Well done. Uh, another one is hey bro h-e-y space b-r-o specifically the kiwi club they are looking to branch out as well and hopefully they'll get into like hey bro in other countries they're mainly online at this point but those are really really decent guys and a lot of their team if you like have been through alcoholism addiction in one form or other and i know to at least have lost children who share their story and as difficult as it is to hear these stories to see these pictures in some instances it sheds an enormous an enormous light on the effects of child loss or addiction even um i never had a real problem with addiction other than a bit of alcohol use for maybe up to a year which I'll go into later in another story. However, the third book, my third book, Mentality, covers other topics. Um, yeah, go check it out. Check out Hey Bro as well. They're brilliant. I'll let them know shouted out here. So, yeah, go for it. And here we are, chapter 24. At home, I had a guardian I'd lied to visit numerous times. He was a good guy called Drake, who looked like a puppet from Thunderbirds. He actually moved his arms in an animated way when he spoke and tried to put all the legal terms into a child's perspective. I liked Drake, but I didn't speak to him as much, as Brenda was always present or right behind the living room door. She was always listening in, even when people thought she wasn't. I got the gist, though. Wenzel was going to prison, and I'd not seen him. Jonathan and Jodie were to see us four times a year, instead of every four weeks, because they were going to be adopted, and it was thought better for the children. They were so young... They wouldn't be affected as much as the older children, and the sooner they had a stable base, the sooner they could get to a normal standard of living. I wanted that for them, didn't I? A happy home where they could be cared for by people who only had one desire, to look after children they could call their own? No, I objected strongly. They're my family. I want them left in care. They're too young to know what they want, and when they're old enough then they can decide. Apparently Wenzel objected too. They were put up for adoption anyway. I was getting on well at High Street Primary School. Most of the kids left me alone because I was eerie, and the teachers left me alone because I pretended to get on with my work. I was a lighting technician in Joseph A's amazing technical dream coat, and my mate George was Joseph, which meant he was a starring role which suited his personality, as everyone seemed to love his charisma and confidence. 
and I turned the light on and off. George was very good at chess. We played often, and we always played five games. In one week it was 3-2 to me, and the next 3-2 to him. Other than George, I was unbeaten in the school. I had to turn my light on when George came on stage, and turn it off when he left, and do the same again at the end of the show. On for his big scene, and off after it. The first day the play was about to start, and all of the lights were already on. I was not happy. Now my job was to turn the light off. I spoke to the headmaster and explained, Look, whoever has turned that light on at the start has really messed up the show. I turned the light on at this point, I said, pointing at my sheet of paper. And then off after this act, I said, pointing again. Then on for when George sings, and off for when he stops. Naturally, it turned out the head teacher was the one who had turned the light on. As luck would have it, he also saw George and me playing chess. If I get some chess boards, were you to run the chess club? He asked me. No, I'll do it, and George can help, I replied. He laughed. Okay. And so we did. Once a week, chess club, where George and I showed people how to play. Then we were entered into a competition against other schools in Cheshire. I loved it. We played competition rules, and it was another level to what we were used to. I'd been taught by Wenzel. White moves first. I'm white because I'm better than you. I'd get a slap if I did a move wrong. Insulted if I took too long to make a move. In no time at all, I was good at chess. I soon learnt to let him win. I'd get a roasting or insulted, but if I was winning, he'd knock his king over and forfeit. There was no well done, no good game. Just, little shit, you think you're good? Set him up. Then he'd beat me, mostly because he was good, and sometimes because I'd let him. I remember coming back to Brenda's with certificates and medals, where I put them in my clothes drawer. Dad would be proud of me, wouldn't he? I saw his case on TV. It lasted about 12 seconds. A man in Cheshire handed himself into the police this morning after killing his wife. That was pretty much it. The papers ran similar, from loving father to wife killer. Yeah, that was my dad. I'd finally got settled at primary school. I had friends and regular activities I enjoyed. I kept my head out of trouble when I could, and at least tried to pay attention at school when it was time to go to high school. I convinced myself it didn't matter to me. More people I don't care about, so what? Lessons I'll sit in on and do what I can be bothered to do. Who cares? Unfortunately, something or an accumulation of things was having an impact on me. My nose blowing got worse, so did my behaviour. I was nicknamed Rudolph at high school because my nose was red most of the time and my top lip cracked and bled. It hurt, but it took my mind off things. I knew it was wrong and not helping me, and so I tried to stop. The more I concentrated on stopping, the more I noticed it, and the more I felt the need to blow my nose. Wenzel had been placed in a mental prison hospital near St. Ellen's, Merseyside. He was charged with manslaughter and got four years. He served two and a half. Less than six months of that was spent in Walton Prison. The rest was the prison hospital where he played pool and scrabble with staff. He was allowed contact, and I visited him twice. A lady who seemed familiar with short red hair led me through to see him. He didn't talk much and looked like shit. I was told he'd tried to kill himself. I knew he hadn't. He'd bragged as a kid he knew how to really slit his wrists. He hunted rabbits and read loads of murder magazines. If he wanted to kill himself, he would have done it. I've got no doubts about that. Everything with Wenzel was sure, and everything had a reason. This was no different. He was putting a face on. He was becoming a stereotype that people would accept. He had faint marks along his wrist. You okay, Dad? I asked, playing straight into his game and trying to defend him at the same time. Look, I love my dad and he loves me, and my body language screamed it. I knew they didn't realise how he thinks. I knew he was using them. I knew because I know exactly how he thinks. I'd had to if I wanted to survive. That's a big statement he would immediately play down, and sounds exaggerative. Unfortunately, it's 100% true. I knew in that one look, Mum had to become the bad person, and he had to look like the good caring one if we all wanted to be back together. I knew that was wrong, but I wanted my family back. As if reading my thoughts, he said, When I get better and get out of here, we can all live together. We'll find a new mummy if you want. He placed his hand on the nurse, as if by accident. She didn't move it. 
I didn't want a new mum. It was my job to take care of Nan and Alan and they died. My job to take care of mum and she died. My job to take care of Jonathan and Jordy and I had no clue where they were. Okay, I said. I wanted dad out. With him out I could get my family back together. I'd had numerous meetings with my guardian ad litem and mostly ignored him. I'd done the same with social workers sitting in silence until they left. Fuck them. Now I had to be different. I had to prove Wenzel a good man. Brenda had started asking questions. Apparently the courts wanted information about Wenzel and Mum. I lied my arse off. Mum used to sit and watch snooker and then have a go at us because we wouldn't eat fast enough. She rarely cooked and when she did she was a bad cook. I'd cry thinking of Wenzel putting me in the corner and his heavy keys hit me in the back as he'd thrown them. Mum threw keys at me. I used to get drunk a lot. It was always Wenzel who took care of us. Wenzel had to take Mum to the hospital a lot because she would hurt herself. The lies were easy. I'd learnt from the best. I hated myself. I didn't dare tell the truth. He wouldn't kill me, but he'd kill someone I love. And besides, he was my only chance at getting the family back together. If I'd told the truth, I would have said, Wenzel took us to the hospital because he wanted to make out that she was crazy. He wouldn't let her out of his sight at the hospital because those cuts and bruises, he'd cause them. Those broken ribs and burns on her arms and legs, he'd cause them. So he'd get her drunk on QC sherry and take her to the hospital to prove how crazy she was, how addicted to alcohol she was, and if she refused, he would beat the kids in front of her. No, I couldn't say that, because that would be the truth. And to be honest, the truth hurt me. What's more, Mother did want the family back together, so I convinced myself I was lying because she'd want me to. Brenda and I did these chats every night where she wrote everything down and every night I looked right into her eyes, made her feel sorry for me, and I lied. My inner anger started to show in high school. Rudolph was called out so much that I drowned it out. I didn't care. What they didn't know is I'd started taking a ruler and scratching my arms until they bled. The friction caused heat, heat and then pain. The pain would temporarily block out my hate of life and myself. Then the bullying started. A lad called Lloydy was first nicking my lunch on the way to school, pushing me. It wasn't primary school. Not talking was not going to be enough to scare him away. At least twice a week he'd be there. Same routine. Hey Rudolph, what you got? I'd try walking past without looking up and be pinned to the hedge or the wall. He'd nick whatever he wanted. Sometimes I'd take a couple of slaps or punches. I'd grab my bag and put back in whatever was thrown around and head to school. When I got home, I'd always be told I did well for eating all my dinner, or how much I was disrespectful because my lunchbox was broken or my bag was ripped. Again, her son knew. He'd seen it happen a few times and done nothing. I didn't expect him to, nor did I care. Hurt me, I screamed inside. Stop me feeling the real pain I had going on. Then there was another lad called Derek Baker who'd throw his attitude around. He never stole from me, but was short and wide, fat and very loud-mouthed. Ugly fucker you are, he'd taunt. taunt. He seemed to have a problem with everyone. A new lad started shortly after I did, called Toby Hasselgeist. I'm sitting here, he said, as I sat at my wooden desk in history class waiting for the teacher to arrive. My bag disappeared from beside me and was thrown across the room. I got up and retrieved it, keeping my head down to find that he'd taken my seat. I sat elsewhere. I didn't do a lot or work in high school, apart from English. I got by on a bare minimum, or just got in trouble for doing nothing. Mrs Howland was brilliant. I had a lot of respect for her. She used to treat us all like adults, and was both polite and yet quiet. She seemed caring and put on a strong front when the kids got a bit over the top. I could see past the facade when she was finding it hard, but she carried on anyway to teach them. I'd got a couple of friends on the estate, and one of them was Nigel Willowood. He also liked martial arts and did karate regularly. He wanted to join the Navy, and I enjoyed training with him in the summer on Brenda's lawn. He was a few years older than me, with pale features and hair that always seemed to be in style, brown and with a quiff. He kind of reminded me of my brother, who also had a unique quiff. We were playing basketball when Lloydie went past. He saw me and ran into the garden, totally ignoring Nigel. I stepped back as he approached in fear and let myself be pinned to the wall. 